Welcome to TFP, the Theater Folk Podcast, the place to be for drama teachers, drama students, and theater educators everywhere. I'm Lindsay Price, resident playwright for Theater Folk. Hello, I hope you're well. Thanks for listening. Right, this is episode 169. You can find any links to this episode in the show notes, which are at theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 169. Uh, ever since it's been made aware to me that I say drama weird, that's all I think about every time I do these podcast intros. Is, is it drama? Is drama the right way to say it? You guys will still like me, right? If I still if I say drama the wrong way. <laughs> Okay, today we are talking Shakespeare, Shakespeare, and Shakespeare in high school, or in school, middle school and high school. And I know that just by saying that sentence, that either there was a smile on your face, Shakespeare, yay, or, or, or you made a a scrunchy face, right? Or your stomach went all squishy. (laughs) <laughs> you know, you're you're thinking about that experience right now, right? Eh, your experience with Shakespeare is, is, is one of those two things. It's either Shakespeare or it's oh, Shakespeare. But if you are a drama, drama teacher, at some point, Shakespeare uh, should make it onto your stage. So what if you have hated him since high school? So Shakespeare is a challenge. Yep, it's a great challenge. It one that's uh, probably easier to embrace than skydiving, but you know I could be wrong. And in this podcast, we've got two teachers, uh, Heidi Frederick and Hilary Martin, both of whom in the past year directed Shakespeare for the first time. It took Heidi fourteen years of teaching before she was able to tackle the bard. And in Hillary's case, not only was she directing Shakespeare for the first time, but many of her actors were acting Shakespeare for the first time. They had no previous exposure. That sounds like an adventure. Yeah, I think so. Let's find out. Let's get to it. Okay, I am talking with Heidi Frederick. Hello, Heidi. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I am. I'm swell. So tell everybody where in the world, uh, where in the world are you? I am in Louisiana. I'm in a small town uh, called Sanama, which is probably about 20 minutes south of Baton Rouge and about 40 minutes north of New Orleans. Oh, cool. Perfect. I get the, I uh, always like it when I can get a good image of where, of where people are. Yes. So we're talking today uh, about Shakespeare, but not just that, that the whole idea of tackling a Shakespeare show for the very first time. How long have you been a teacher? This is my 14th year. This is your 14th year and you just did your Shakespeare show. Um, I'm actually um, just about to open it. That's it. Yes. Okay. So, So are you nervous? I'm very nervous. <laughs> My very first Shakespeare show, and I'm very nervous. Okay, well, let's. I bet you. I bet you, you did fine. So let's go back to the very beginning. So, what made you decide that you had to tackle Shakespeare? Well, I've always wanted to do Shakespeare, but I've always been very apprehensive about tackling Shakespeare. The language, of course, has always held me back. I I, I had taught English for quite a many years. So I had taught Shakespeare before and I knew the struggles that students had with the language. Even though I know Shakespeare was written to be performed, I was very nervous about having my theater students perform it. But I like to let my students inspire me, especially my advanced students. They inspire me as far as what plays I choose for them to perform for their um, particular production that semester. So um, I kind of get the feel for them, see what they're into. And I don't know, I was just looking for shows and everything kept coming up Shakespeare, Shakespeare, Shakespeare. And so I finally said, look, maybe this is the year I've been teaching for a while. I'm not, you know, a spring chicken, but maybe I can do this. It kind of sounds like, uh, and it really sounds like it was if you're if you're looking to your students to uh, influence the shows that they were on board with it too. 
Yes, they were. Um, at first, they were a little apprehensive, but um, we went to our state thespian festival in January, and we, we went through a, a Shakespearean workshop. And so after that, they felt a little bit more comfortable with the language, learning the iambic pentameter, and also our local university, uh, LSU, they came to our school, and they did a Shakespearean workshop with us. And so that helped us and helped the students to, again, become a lot more comfortable and familiar with the characters, but uh, especially with the language. What a great idea. You know, if you've got like if you're uh, if you're in a, a, a thespian troupe, you're going to have a festival. There's going to be some help for you. And instead of just struggling alone, you know, like, you know, bring in bring in the cavalry, bring in the people who can give a doorway for your students. Yes, definitely. I was calling all the troops to help me out because I, could, <laughs> I cannot do this alone. <laughs> well, nor do you have to. in this day and age. You just don't have to. You know, there's there's uh, there's there's access everywhere. You know, even if it's just online. Right. So, and which uh, which show did you put up? We are doing Romeo and Juliet. Right. And what was your first step when you have Romeo and Juliet in your in your hands and before your auditions, before you're like even thinking about sets and costumes and all of that, what was your first step to approach this thing that was uh, made you feel apprehensive? Well, uh, the first thing that I did was I, I looked at many different abridged scripts to see if I could find one that wasn't too long, but wasn't too short. I, I found many, you know, one act versions, but with it being my advanced class, I wanted them to have a full length version, but I didn't want it four hours long. Um, so yeah, you don't, you don't really want for your first time, you know, four hours is a little much. <laughs> right. so I reached out to, um, the open forum through educational theater association and I got a lot of, a lot of my colleagues on there sent me copies of theirs, um, of their abridged versions. And so I kind of started from there and I ended up writing my own version of Romeo and Juliet. So <laughs> Holy smokes. Did you um, amend the language or did you keep the original Shakespearean text? Oh, I kept the original language. The only the only thing that I changed was um, Seattle because we set it in Seattle instead of Verona. And I changed uh, Mantua into uh, Everett because that's a city right outside of Seattle. So those were the only two words we changed. Okay, so let's get into your vision for this. So you obviously had a very specific place that you wanted to set it. And it's a place that's quite, you know, it's quite far. It's got a different feeling and vibe from where you are in uh, Louisiana. So why did you want this particular setting location? What was your vision for this show? Well, I knew I wanted to set it in a different period, and um, I, I didn't want it to be, you know, the regular Shakespeare with the beautiful costumes, and I wanted to do something different and fun and funky, and um, I, I'm 37, and so when I grew up in high school, I was very much into the grunge music, the alternative music, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, things like that, and so... The, the story between Romeo and Juliet is, uh, is very fast-paced, um, it's, it's very angsty, um, and it happens, it happens over the course of five days. So I thought, what other perfect time period um, to, to place it in other than, you know, like teenager times? So I thought back to my teen times and what was inspiring to me, and of course it was that kind of music. And so I started listening to some of that music and I was like, wow, we could really, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling this. I, I'm, I'm thinking about the plot and, and I'm getting inspired by the music. And, and so I'm thinking, okay, it's kind of like Courtney Love and Kurt Cobain almost. Um, their kind of love story was very fast and, and, and had a lot of angst in it, just like Romeo and Juliet. So that's kind of where I, I started thinking about setting it in Seattle. You know what? And it's just a uh, what a great sort of hint out to teachers who are listening who are like, uh, I'm never directing a Shakespeare play is when you're doing something so far out of your comfort zone, find a little comfort, right? Like find something that you connect to and that you relate to. It's just going to make your experience smoother. Definitely. It's definitely made the experience much smoother much easier for me. I don't know. Well, I don't know if easier is the right word, but it's so much more fun. And I know when I'm having fun, the kids are having fun. 
And they're learning about this whole new era, which was my high school time. But it, I think it's also helping them to understand the story a lot better and to, to understand the language a lot better. Any, any doorway you can give them, I think that's the, way to, that's the way to do it. Shakespeare is such an interesting, it's so interesting because the stories are so universal. You really can put them in a different era and it doesn't affect the story all that much. Exactly. I mean, our set is scaffolding. We're using scaffolding for our set. We have um, a balcony for the Capulets, a balcony for the Montagues, and then we have a neutral platform in the in the middle. And then um, I have some broken pieces of technology, computer screens, TV screens. My kids will have pagers because it's set in 1994. So it's the beginning of, you know, technology and the internet and things like that. So they'll be dressed in that style. So they're learning about that period. But also the set is kind of aesthetic, if you will, and also kind of grungy as well. Um, so they're learning about that too. And, and I think it, it also kind of sets the mood for the feelings of, of Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so when you started down your rehearsal road, what about any changes that you had to make in your, your rehearsal process? If you've been directing and, and or you've been teaching for 14 years, you have a lot of shows under your belt. So how does Shakespeare change your rehearsal process? We definitely had to look at the language and analyze the script a lot more closely than any other script I've ever worked on. I actually have taught Romeo and Juliet six times to an English class. So I, I guess I, maybe that's why I picked it because I felt more comfortable with it. But um, most of my students had never even read Romeo and, and Juliet. So we got some No Fear Shakespeare books and we went through them. They went through them individually. We went through them together looking at uh, the paraphrasing and what each line meant so that they know exactly what they're saying, so that they're not just up there saying all these words. They know what's going on. They know the story. They know why they're saying these things and to whom they're saying them. And, you know, so looking at the words has been a much more intensive uh, and intimate process. Uh, for this play than any other show I've ever directed. It's just amazing how it's a, it's a, you know, teaching is one thing, but then bringing it to life. Right. Cool. So what was your collaboration like with your cast with uh, this play? Oh, it's just been wonderful. I, I get inspired by my students, um, especially my advanced class. I, try to make, um, at my school, I try to make my advanced class kind of like the honors type theater class. So they have a lot of input into their show. They have a lot of, if they, I want them to provide suggestions and I want them to, especially with their characters. And if they feel, uh, with their blocking, they need to move somewhere. Of course, they have to tell me why they're moving, but you know, they're providing me evidence from the script and from their character. And so I know that they're thinking about all these things. And um, to me, that, that just means that I've done my job as a teacher and they're analyzing their script, they're analyzing their character. And I love to collaborate with them. That it's not just my show, it's their show. You know, it's, it's them bringing these characters to life and they are telling the story. So a as we are working together to create this show, the more that they can and bring to the, the stage and the more that they can bring to the show, I applaud them for that. I love when they, they bring ideas. Was there ever a point as you're, as you're heading towards your opening night where um, they got frustrated and they weren't sure if they were going to be able to pull it off? A couple of times they did. Um, memorizing has not been as easy as as they thought, but actually they're they're um, surprising me. They're they're much further along at this point than I thought they would be. So um, I'm actually pretty proud of them. They've been studying a lot, but um, yes, they definitely have gotten frustrated time and time again. You know what? It's it's that thing though where if you have a high expectation for your students, if you're you you just go, I expect you and I know that you can learn these lines. They're always they always do surprise you, don't they? Like they they, do. they yeah. always write they always go to the bar that you set. They do. They do. And I, I 
I guess that's the reason I keep coming back every year. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. You know, like, well, what else would you know, if if it's not fulfilling for you? Exactly. Then then, you know, well, why do it? So what do you think you've learned in this uh, in this process? What is Shakespeare uh, and in tackling Shakespeare taught you? I, I've definitely overcome my fear of Shakespeare. I will definitely be doing more Shakespearean shows, possibly even tackling maybe some Tennessee Williams on a small scale. I, I've definitely been nervous about uh, tackling him. But um, I, I've always been kind of leery of playwrights that I hold in, in high esteem because I wasn't sure if high school students could really comprehend the, the text. But I think that through this process and watching my students comprehend, analyze, understand, and bring these characters to life in Romeo and Juliet, I I now know that my high school students really can do this. And they can fully bring these characters to life and they understand and they know and they can put on a phenomenal show. I think that's a lovely place to end in that if, if 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 you can see them do the work, and you can see them bring something difficult to light, then there's nothing they can't do. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's a good message for uh, anyone out there, again, listening, who is who is a little Shakespeare weirds them out. It's like, well, you know, why not? Why not? Why not take on the challenge? Let them try it. And, and most of the time, they will rise to your expectations. Awesome. Thank you so much, Heidi. Thank you so much. All right. I am talking to Hillary Martin. Hello, Hillary. Hi. Now, we're talking about uh, directing Shakespeare, working with Shakespeare uh, for the first time. So this, you're in the middle of a uh, production, right? You're in uh, Much Ado About Nothing. We are. Awesome. And so before you took on this challenge, this journey, so what had been your relationship with Shakespeare? I mean, I'm very familiar with Shakespeare, read a lot, studied it in school, written about it, acted in a couple of Shakespeare. I've actually been in Much Ado About Nothing, stage managed Shakespeare. That's my background is stage management. So I'm very, very comfortable with Shakespeare, but um, had never had the opportunity to direct it or to do it with students. Because that's a different thing, isn't it? That it's one thing to be on the side when you are reading it, studying it, doing it as part of classwork, when you have to kind of step over the other side of the table and not only create a world or a vision for the play, you also have to bring students along. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's a whole different ballgame. And a big part of it was getting the kids to trust me. Um, This is my fourth year at this school. So I have my core group of theater kids who have enough trust in me now that when I said, we're going to do Shakespeare, they were like, okay, instead of saying, you're crazy. (laughs) That was the that was the most trepidatious. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, they were. They still probably do think I'm crazy, but they at least were willing to come along for the ride. And what made you decide that now was the time to direct Shakespeare? Two years ago, I'm at a K-12 school. So I see kids starting when they're in kindergarten. And then by middle school, high school, the theater kids have sort of decided who they are. Um, And so I have a core group of really committed kids. And I have one girl who's a senior now who... In her sophomore year, we studied some scenes from Much Ado in the directing elective that I teach. And she loved it. And she's like, we have to do this play. And she's a very talented actress. And I felt like she deserves the chance to play Beatrice. So I was like, all right, it's her senior year. We're going to go for it. That's kind of awesome. It's sort of like, yeah. <laughs> okay, you know, you've opened the door. Let's let's all go through together. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this was also sort of the year, you know, I have the right kids for the parts. I have the right numbers. And like I said, they finally trust me enough that they're willing to pretty much do whatever weird experiments <laughs> I decide to put them through. So when you, all right, you made the choice, you're like, okay, I've got my Beatrice, I've got my kids, I am going to now put on my director's hat and become 
and take this play on. What were your first steps when you were uh, approaching Shakespeare for the first time as a director? I first, the first thing I did was think a lot about what can I do as sort of pre-rehearsal things to get these kids to understand the story. So we spent two weeks before we even really, before they even picked up the script doing, we watched one of the film versions. I found some great lesson plan resources online for introducing the characters and story. We sort of talked about Shakespeare in general. We looked at some little bits and pieces of language to say, okay, what's happening here? In terms of developing my vision for the show, I'm my directing process with kids is very collaborative. So I usually have a few loose ideas, but a lot of it comes together as we're rehearsing. And for this particular show, I wasn't 100% sure where I wanted to go with it until we started rehearsing. And um, one day in rehearsal, as we were doing a scene, a couple of kids, a couple of the seniors who understood, could sort of understand the scenes better, sat in the audience and were doing sort of a studio audience kind of a thing, you know, going, ooh, at the right moments and stuff like that. And I went, oh my gosh, this is a soap opera. So we're doing Much Ado as a soap opera. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that interesting too how, because there is, this is really, it's really nice to hear that, that a different kind of process because for a lot of you know uh, directors we talk about vision and this and that's some okay I'm going into it and here's the vision right and I'm gonna right. I'm gonna explain the vision to you and that sometimes not all directors work that way and that collaborative process is sometimes really necessary for students to feel at home in a piece Yeah. And I think especially with something like this, where it's hard for them to own the characters, it's hard for them to own the language because they're, because it's so difficult. So, but they really, once I came up with this soap opera idea, they've really latched on and it's helped them grip onto, oh, okay. So my acting should be kind of like this. And when I'm sad, it should be a little over the top. And when I'm angry, it needs to be big. So I think it was really important that they helped me find that. They're such extremes. I mean, like, uh, uh, not Don Pedro, uh, the villain, Don, um, Don, Don, John. Don John. I mean, he is a soap opera villain. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. He's just, he's a bad guy because he's a bad guy and he wants to ruin their lives. Yeah. Like, and yeah. And we have like yeah. the typical and the typical hero, the typical heroine, hero who is the heroine, you know, like yeah. that kind of thing. So once you establish this, how did you develop it, you know, with with costumes and with sets and with characteriz- characterization, you sort of, you know, talked a bit about how they're going to act in soap opera, but how did the whole piece come together on that theme? We're, well, like I said, the acting's going to be kind of over the top, which I'm hoping will also help the audience along, just like the kids don't have a lot of experience with Shakespeare. Our audience won't have had a lot of exposure to Shakespeare. So anything we can do to help the audience come along with us, and even if they don't quite understand, oh, what does he think Hero did? They're going to get Claudio's mad at Hero, and he's done this horrible thing, you know, casting her off at their wedding. So the acting will be very over the top. Our costumes, we're, we've been delving into, my um, assistant director and I are delving into fashion color theory and sort of seasons we've assigned each kind of grouping of characters a season you know who's a summer who's a winter who's an autumn and our color palette will be all based around that that's pretty awesome okay so I have a question that because I just I love um anytime we can talk about visuals so will before Beatrice and Benedict are together, will they, are they in the same color or is it something that changes? That will change a little bit. They are both going to be, they're both autumns. Okay. So they'll both have kind of autumn colors, but different ones. And then as once they've fallen for each other, um, we're going to add something. I'm not sure what yet for Benedict, it'll probably be a tie. And for Beatrice, I'm not sure. But something that's the exact same, same color. color. Yes. I love it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And uh, yeah, I really like, because it's like, it's something, 
anything that we you, you you make a good point you know if you're if your students aren't that have that much exposure to Shakespeare which we'll talk about in a second your audience probably doesn't and anything you can do to visually tell your story right is going to be helpful Right. So let's talk about this. So not only is this your first time directing Shakespeare with students, but you have a fair number of students who who have had no previous experience with Shakespeare. Yes. So talk about that. Talk about uh, what it was like to sort of bring them into this world and what was their resistance. And yeah. I've been amazed at how little resistance they've had. They really are. They're like, all right, we're going to go for it and do the best we can. I've also been amazed at how well developed, I guess, their acting instincts are. Even, you know, I kind of talked about we did a lot of pre rehearsal stuff and sort of got to know the stories and characters. But even from the first time they picked up scripts and we started reading through scenes, a lot of their delivery was it wasn't perfect, but it was on the right track. You know, they could tell, oh, okay, this is supposed to be a little sarcastic or this is supposed to be a little angry which I thought was really impressive. You know, they were able to use what language they could understand and use punctuation and what they knew of the story to figure that out. They've really enjoyed watching me try to explain the uh, double entendres and dirty jokes <laughs> without <laughs> coming right out and, you know, being really inappropriate. I think they're enjoying those verbal gymnastics. Um, and there have been a few times where I've just looked at one of the seniors and been like, can you just whisper in his ear? what he's saying, so I don't have to say it. <laughs> They've I've used a lot of resources. I have a great um, book that's basically a Shakespeare dictionary that has a lot of specific words and phrases that's been really handy. And we've sort of, I think the key has been going really slow. We've spent a lot of time, you know, just reading through we're going to read through the scene and stop me every time you're confused and the first time through we're stopping every line or two what am I saying here what's this what would be the reaction to that um but now they're really starting to get it and sort of piece it together well I think just the fact of when you started rehearsals it was two whole weeks without even looking at a script yeah. You know, like, can you imagine if you had like just delved in and went, all right, guys, sink or swim, here you go. <laughs> right. It would have been a mess. <laughs> How are you? Is it a lot of, because uh, you're working with a, a, lar a large uh, age range too. Yes. I have seventh graders up through seniors. And how is that? Is there some sort of com camaraderie because they're kind of all in the same boat? Is there some mentoring? Like how is the age range working for or against you? I think it really works for us. We're because we're a K-12 school and we're very small. Our high school has about 60 students. Our middle school has about 30, 35. So our shows traditionally, other than our one act competition show, our fall and spring shows are mixed middle and high school. So this group of kids works together a lot. And they're very tight knit group. You know, you see during lunch, the high school kids go and sit for a few minutes with the middle school theater kids and chat in a way that you don't see as much across the age range with the other kids in the school. And there's a lot of cast leadership amongst particularly the seniors. You know, the seniors are the ones kind of when they're off stage sitting with one of the seventh or eighth graders and running lines, or when we're doing a character building journal entry or a character building improv, sitting with the younger kids and figuring it out. And my ninth graders who I've been working with since they were in sixth grade are now starting to come into more of that leadership role as well, which is really fun to see. Absolutely. Cause then it's, it's, uh, it's more than Shakespeare. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So, uh, what has been, what's been the thing that you've learned the most, uh, in this process? Um, the thing that I've learned the most, that's an excellent question. Your English teacher is your friend. Uh, definitely, definitely don't be afraid to collaborate with the English teacher. I've spent, there have been a few times I've gone upstairs and been like, can you help me work through the scene? Cause I get it, but I don't know if I get it well enough to explain it. Um, and that kind of thing. And, you know, work with because she's taught Shakespeare. So I've worked a lot with her to figure out how do I, how do I teach them this? So I'm not just explaining, oh, you know, this is what you're saying here. I want them to, 
I want them to be able to do that kind of decoding on their own. I don't want to just be saying, say it like this. Right. You So you want to know it so that you can um, guide them if they start to go astray, but you don't want to do it for, you don't want to do the work for them. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and uh, so where's your, uh, where's your, 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 your fear of, or trepidation of directing Shakespeare? Most, it sounds like it, you sound, you sound pretty good, actually. It sounds like it's, it's I, uh, been pretty comfortable. Yeah, I was definitely nervous to start out with. I was, um, yeah, I was definitely nervous to start out with, but sort of fake it till you make it, I guess. I was like, I can't show fear to the kids because if I'm scared of Shakespeare, they will be. That's exactly it, isn't it? You know, like it's the only way to to show them that that it's okay is to show them that you're okay with it. Exactly. <laughs> That's all your acting skills are coming coming yeah. home to roost, you know. <laughs> uh, when do you open? Um, it's Memorial Day weekend, ah, so it's 27th, I you think. You have so much time. You guys are going to yeah. rock it. You're going to rock it. Thank you so much uh, for talking to me today. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Heidi and Hillary. Okay, before we go, let's do some theater folk news. Let's talk. Let's talk Shakespeare adaptations. <laughs> I have my I have my hands like in the air like this is like yay I won the lottery Shakespeare adaptation okay um you do not have to take Hamlet in its four hour glory plunk it down in front of your students and say okay make it happen kiddos make it happen that will not only turn off your students it may give you the stomach ache to end all stomach aches so how do you gateway into Shakespeare so let your friends here at Theater Folk, let us help you. So first of all, we have a Shakespeare monologue book and a Shakespeare scene book, solo spear and scene spear reflectively, reflectively, respectively, right? Yes. I'm reflecting on that it is respectively. Okay, start slow with monologues and scenes. And both these books, they have summaries of the moment, what's happening, and vocabulary help too. What your students will need to give their best in that moment. We also have two Shakespeare categories, adaptations and parodies, and then Shakespeare in an hour. So let's start with that one. Our Shakespeare in an hour series takes a variety of Shakespeare's plays uh, in the original language. So it's all out Shakespeare, but we have cut them down to about an hour, which I think in high school is a manageable amount. And we've also included annotated notes, vocabulary help, character questions, action suggestions, story details. It's all there for you to have an experience with the original language of Shakespeare, um, but with a little bit of help. And then with our adaptations and parodies, we're taking the original stories and giving it a twist, whether it's making it modern or whether it's taking the story and turning it uh, upside down. Like, so for example, in Drop Dead Juliet, we have the story of Romeo and Juliet, where Juliet is sick of the dying. She wants more love and less death. So how does she retell the original story? Guess she Is she able to retell the original story? And then in another one, a Much Ado High School, we have the plot points of the original play, but the whole thing is set at a high school dance. I think these plays are a great introduction to Shakespeare in a context that is a little more uh, welcoming, a little more of an open door. So you can introduce your students to Shakespeare. You can interest your students in Shakespeare. Who knows? Maybe even some of them will love it. We can be optimistic, right? Yes, you and me, we can be optimistic. Of course we can. Uh, so I put the links in the show notes for all of these goodies, which you can find at theaterfolk.com forward slash episode 169. Finally, where or oh, where can you find this podcast? We post new episodes every second Tuesday at theaterfolk.com and on our Facebook page and Twitter. You can find us on youtube.com forward slash theaterfolk and on the Stitcher app. You can subscribe to TFP on iTunes. All you have to do is search for the word theaterfolk. And that's where we're going to end. Take care, my friends. Take care. <laughs>